So thanks so much for uh, hosting tonight and for inviting me to be here. So um, I do usually work in uh, areas related to skill, motor skill, embodied skill. And this is going to be sort of a uh, preliminary foray into moral virtue and the connections between motor skill and moral virtue, something that I've thought about sort of uh, in, has been in the background of a lot of my work, but this is going to be the first time that I'm actually putting some of these thoughts together. So we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> so um, as many of you know, um, Virtue ethicists often make use of practical skill in order to illustrate the nature of virtue or to illustrate the nature of moral cognition. Um, and one important commitment of this kind of account is that cognition or moral behavior, uh, moral cognition or moral behavior, is learned through practice, right? And that's uh, to be contrasted with learning it through something like deliberation or reflection or memorization alone. Now, this kind of commitment uh, has its roots in uh, Aristotle and the Nicomachean Ethics, where Aristotle states that what we need to learn to do, we learn by doing. For example, we become builders by building and lyre players by playing the lyre. So too, we become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate actions, and courageous by courageous actions. So generally, does, that, does anyone know where this is from? It's funny, ask an American audience, everyone knows. So there's a Spike Lee movie, I'll do the right thing. Um, and this is, this is a scene from that movie. Anyhow, that's be totally beside the point, but just kind of getting a gauge with the audience. So generally, most virtue ethicists hold something like the following view. Uh, learning which reaction or response to a moral situation is the correct uh, action or response, requires regularly instantiating the right actions in the right situations in childhood and beyond. So again, this kind of learning, uh, actually doing the right thing over and over and over again is supposed to be contrasted with just thinking about what the appropriate or the moral action um, is supposed to be or deliberating about it, right? Um, we actually have to perform the action in order to learn then which action is the right action um, in these situations. So if we wanted to, if we wanted to put this in functionalist terms, or if we wanted to put this sort of in cognitive science terms, we might say something like this. Virtue ethicists appeal to practice, again, just the regular, I'm just using practice as the regular instantiation of the appropriate action, in order to explain how agents are able to select the appropriate and thus moral output given a certain input. Um, what I'm going to claim is that virtue ethicists have largely only given us half of the story. In particular, that in focusing on outputs or on the right actions or the right responses to moral situations, virtue ethicists have overlooked a crucial facet of moral cognition. Namely, that through practice, moral agents develop a cachet of perceptual skills that allow them to attend to, detect, and identify <coughs> the relevant features of a perceptual array, the selection of which is central to recognizing and categorizing a situation as a moral situation of a particular type or as a moral situation in the first place. Um, so the idea is that the perceptual skills are perceptual skills that detect inputs, right? That, um, that we're detecting moral features in the first place. So in order to support this claim, what I'm going to do, um, perhaps a bit untraditionally, is to appeal to the sports psychology literature um, on motor expertise uh, that shows that the expert's capacity 
to attend to and recognize relevant perceptual inputs differs uh, in important and systematic ways from the novice or from the non-expert. So uh, very generally then, this is the, the claim that I'm going to be defending is that if we take the analogy between moral cognition and practical skill seriously, then we need to do justice to the moral agent's abilities to discriminate, identify, and detect the relevant features of a moral array, and not only on their ability to select uh, and subsequently perform the appropriate actions. Okay, so just so you know what's coming, here's a little outline of the talk. You'll know where, where to zone out, usually about 10 to 15 minutes in. <laughs> All of the questions are usually about the first part. Anyway, let's see. So um, in the first part of the talk, what I'm going to do is just present three examples um, of virtue ethicists justifying the claim that practice is required for uh, moral cognition. And I'm just going to do this to emphasize uh, that most of these explanations focus almost exclusively on actions or on outputs, right? They, so they, they largely ignore how it is that we select the appropriate inputs, even though they're thinking of moral cognition as a kind of expertise, as, as a kind of skill. So um, Julia Annas, like most virtue ethicists, holds that virtue is acquired through practice. Um, and for Annas, while virtue is acquired by performing virtuous deeds, the performance of these deeds is by no means sufficient for virtue. So at the very heart of her account, there's this distinction between what she calls a sub-rational knack and a practical skill, of which virtue is an instance of the latter, but simply performing virtuous actions is an example of the former. So for Anna, skilled agents not only have the ability to perform virtuous actions, that is, the right action directed at the right person, at the right time, in the right circumstances, again, this is sort of the Aristotelian way of spelling out what the right or the appropriate action is, um, but these agents also have the ability to understand and explain why that action is the right action in a particular set of circumstances. Right? Um, so they have this understanding and that allows them to come up with an explanation of why an action is the right action in a given context. And for, for Annas, this is absolutely central to um, what makes virtue, moral, moral virtue, a skill and not just um, some sort of ability or knack. So there's just some quotes for Annas. Um, she writes, um, the virtuous agent has the ability to convey why what is done is done. And then again, she goes on to write, indeed, just this serves to mark off skill, techne, from an inarticulate knack, imperia. The skilled person can give an account of what he does, which involves being able to explain why he is doing what he is doing. That virtue has these features and that they are centrally important to what virtue is, is one of the main claims of the book. The book, of course, being intelligent virtue. So for my purposes, the most important thing that we should notice about Annas's account is that for her, moral expertise seems to lie almost exclusively on the reactions or, react or responses to moral situations, right? So both doing the right thing and being able to explain why that is the right thing to do in that particular set of circumstances uh, is focused on the out, what I'm calling the output side, if we wanted to put it in cog side terms, right? It's focused on reactions or re responses to moral situations. Now, a related suggestion is that performing virtuous actions is required for the acquisition of moral cognition or virtue because identifying the right action cannot be articulated or organized into general principles. Rather, it's thought that virtue uh, requires knowledge 
of what to do in particular situations. Right? Um, and this is a quote from McDowell. There need be no possibility of reducing virtuous behavior to rules. In moral upbringing, what one learns is not to behave in conformity with rules of conduct, but to see situations in a special light as constituting reasons for acting. The perceptual capacity, once acquired, can be exercised in complex novel circumstances, not necessarily capable of being foreseen and legislated for by a codifier of the conduct required by virtue, however wise or thoughtful he might be. Now, what we should notice here is that the emphasis is on the impossibility of codifying rules for behavior, right? or for translating reasons for action into general principles. Right? And though McDowell considers virtue to involve a perceptual capacity, it's important to see that this perceptual capacity is not detecting moral situations or moral features as such, but rather it's detecting the reasons for action. Right? In some, again, we see that what McDowell is saying is that there's an impossibility of giving general rules for selecting the right input in particular, sorry, the right output in a particular situation. Now, that might all be true, right? Even if it's true, though, that the appropriate response to a given situation is impossible to codify into general principles, when it comes to moral expertise, what I want to claim is that this is only half the story. Right? That um, standard accounts of virtue just don't address the possibility that there's likely another part of virtue or of moral cognition that might be equally difficult to, or impossible to codify uh, into general principles, and that um, this aspect of moral cognition is also likely refined through practice. And maybe um, it's necessarily refined through practice. I think I'll, I'll make that claim. There's no other way to develop uh, this kind of perceptual capacity except through practice, namely the ability to detect, attend to, recognize, identify, and make predictions based upon the morally relevant features of a moral situation. So sort of in a nutshell, the claim that I want to defend is that moral expertise requires perceptual skill insofar as perceptual inputs are concerned. Right? This is uh, a crucial part of moral virtue or moral skill um, that one refines one's ability to select the, the appropriate inputs, that one is confronted with a moral situation in the first place, that one um, is confronted with a moral situation of a particular type. OK, so just one last reason that virtue ethicists often uh, hold um, for claiming that the acquisition of virtue requires practice, it, uh, again, just as opposed to study or reflection deliberation, is that virtu the virtuous agent sees and does the right thing automatically. Right? Um, that is, the virtuous agent perceives what is required of her immediately without having to consult rules um, or deliberate about general principles. Right? Again, we just saw maybe those kinds of rules or general principles aren't even available because they're impossible to uh, codify. But the idea is that uh, in the beginning stages, uh, when we're starting to learn uh, to become moral agents, we're given rules or heuristics, but those sort of act as training wheels. Uh, and once we really become moral experts, if we become moral experts, we no longer need those training wheels. Right? What we have is this sort of internalized framework which allows us to automatically um, see and to automatically respond <coughs> effectively uh, to the nuance and the particularity of various moral situations. And this is a quote from Wisniewski. Uh, Through repeated exposure to situations that involve moral action, even when these situations initially involve deliberation and judgment, 
we can develop the ability to respond immediately to the situation we perceive. The situation becomes unitized or chunked, and what once required cognitive effort becomes automatic and immediate. This is perhaps just another way of pointing out that repeated experience matters. What we learn, sorry, um, what we learn, that we learn, but what we learn to do is sometimes to perceive immediately the essential nature of particular situations, and this can involve immediate recognition of the kind of action called for by the situation. But again, as with the other uh, accounts of why practice matters, uh, we see that why practice is required for the acquisition of expert or moral cognition, that is, what becomes automatized, what becomes immediate, according to this kind of account, is the right response or the, right, or the selection of the appropriate action in a moral situation, right? What we see is that what becomes immediate is the detection of a reason for action. But again, we haven't said anything about how it is that practice may uh, develop automatic perceptual skills for attending to and identifying moral situations in the first place. So in the next section, what I'm going to do is sort of sh shift gears and present you with some empirical evidence from sports psychology um, that strongly suggests that experts differ from non-experts in at least three ways when it comes to the selection of perceptual input. So uh, experts and non-experts differ in the ways in which they attend to the same perceptual array. Experts and non-experts recognize and thus recall different domain-specific patterns or properties of a perceptual array. And experts and non-experts differ in the ways in which they detect and use information. That is, experts are able to use early visual cues to make quicker and more accurate predictions than non-experts. Now, again, the reason that these differences matter really comes down to how seriously we want to take the analogy between virtue and practical skill. So at the very least, it seems reasonable that if we think that moral cognition really is a kind of practical skill, right, and what studies of, of skills show us, right? So if we think of virtue as a kind of moral expertise, right, and we look at expertise in the sports domain, and we see that experts in all of these domains, right, in a wide variety of practical skills, select and organize perceptual inputs in categorically different ways than non-experts, then this should force us to think seriously about how moral experts may attend and identify and make predictions in ways that differ significantly from the moral novice or the moral layperson. Right? So the idea is that um, if we really take this idea seriously, it might be that, we, that the, expert, the moral expert literally sees the world differently from the moral novice in, in the way that um, a um, professional or an expert sports person sees the relevant domain of sport differently from the non-expert or the layperson. So <clears throat> in examining the sports psychology literature, uh, one feature that emerges across multiple domains, decades of research, is that experts develop the capacity to effectively allocate attention for efficient information pickup in ways that differ, systematic that differ systematically from the non-experts. So specifically, it's been found that experts employ fewer visual fixations than non-experts. So inter alia, they attend to fewer locations. And those fixations last for longer periods of time than the fixations of non-experts. So the plausible background assumption here, because these are all um, eye-tracking tasks, 
right? So uh, the plausible background assumption here is that looking to a particular location um, is importantly connected to attending to that particular location and retrieving information from the location where one looks. Right? So now, evidence of these kinds of attentional differences between experts and non-experts has accumulated for decades, right? So we have about three decades of robust research on this. This isn't sort of cutting edge neuroscience. <laughs> this is sort of old school, old school sports psychology. So um, there's uh, Tildesley in 1982, which is you know, practically ancient times when it comes to cognitive science, uh, was studying expert soccer players. Uh, and what they found was that when viewing a right-footed player strike the ball, the experienced players did not fixate on either the supporting leg or any part of the left side of the body. Their scanning behavior was more structured and consistent than that of novices, with fixations being restricted to the right side of the body and the shooting leg. Now, we have similar observations across a wide range of sporting domains. So there's been studies in basketball, soccer, fencing, tennis, table tennis, volleyball, baseball, um, several others, including French boxing, which I, I bet people here know what French boxing is, no? Anyone? No. I have no idea what it is. I figured that, you know, maybe you didn't know the do the right thing, Spike Lee, but you would know French boxing. Apparently not. It's a bad assumption. Anyhow, we have a wide variety of studies um, in a wide variety of, of differing um, domains, different sports, and what we see is um, that experts are able to attend in ways or that expert's attention differs in important respects from that of the non-expert, right? So how should we interpret this evidence, right? What's going on here? I think it seems reasonable to interpret uh, the above evidence in the following way, right? So experts fixate on fewer locations uh, because experts know where to look, right? They know where the most rich and relevant sources of information are to be found, and they direct their attention immediately to those areas. Uh, another important point is that experts look to fewer places than non-experts, and I think that we should interpret this as important because they ignore the irrelevant or the information poor areas of a visual domain. Right? So in short, we're going to say something like the expert visual search is more efficient than the visual search of the non-expert. Now, uh, in developing efficient search strategies, experts also spend more time, right? That's what we've, that we see across a wide range of domains. Experts spend more time looking at the locations that they've selected. Uh, and I think the plausible way to interpret that evidence is to say that uh, experts fix it for longer so that they can pick up more information from the task-relevant information-rich regions. Um, and so they're extracting more information, more relevant information than the non-expert. OK. Um, we have another paradigm, which is the recall and recognition paradigm. So this is uh, a paradigm which shows us that there's um, an important difference between experts and non-experts uh, that's reflected in the fact that experts are able to recognize and recall complex domain-specific patterns more quickly and effectively than non-experts. Now, um, this is thought to be due to the expert's superior abilities of encoding, and by encoding, I just mean something like um, organizing and storing and retrieving, so just accessing. Um, domain-specific information. So this uh, paradigm also um, is, uh, I mean, this is an even older paradigm. This is from, the, from 1965. So again, this is well-established that we see these kinds of distinction. Uh, and we see this across a wide range of domains. Again, chess, gymnastics, volleyball, basketball, <coughs> American football and even snooker. So some of you might be familiar with sort of the seminal study 
in this domain. It was conducted by de Groot, as I said, in 1965. So de Groot was studying chess players um, at various levels of skill, um, from the grandmaster to just the, the club level player. And what uh, de Groot showed was that when chess masters were shown a game configuration uh, for about five to 10 seconds, they were able to recall the position of the chess pieces almost perfectly from memory, which is very impressive. But in contrast, uh, the ability dropped off very, very uh, rapidly below the master level. So we went from an accuracy of 93% to 51% for the club player for recognizing um, positions on the chessboard. Now, of course, from this, it's completely unclear what's going on, right? We might just think that, you know, master chess players have uh, superior perceptual abilities, perceptual pattern recognition abilities, perceptual, or they might have superior uh, mnemonic abilities. Um, but this was ruled out by another very important study that was conducted um, eight years later by Chase and Simon who improved on the initial de Groot study by including um, a control condition where pieces were um, displayed on a chessboard, but they were arranged randomly, right? So they weren't arranged in a chess-related or meaningful fashion. Um, and what they found was that in this condition, right, where there isn't, where there's sort of just a random kind of configuration of pieces, there's absolutely no difference <laughs> between the uh, master, the grandmaster, and the club level player, right? So what does this show? It shows, and again, this has been replicated in lots of different domains. What this shows is that expert chess players neither have superior perceptual or mnemonic abilities, but rather their superior skill comes from the ability to recognize and <coughs> recall meaningful chess-related configurations. Right? Um, and we can conclude that it's not uh, the memory or the perceptual abilities, right? but th that this kind of capacity is domain-specific. Right? It's not just a general capacity for uh, superior pattern recognition. Um, and again, we see that this is not the case with the non-expert, an important difference. So the idea is that experts are able to take in more information in a single glance than less skilled players because their knowledge allows them to organize uh, these configurations into larger, more meaningful units. Um, and the idea is that if we group stimuli in a particular way, this allows us to see patterns right, um, or higher level features that just aren't apparent to uh, less skilled or unskilled player, right? We have, you might think of these as emergent features or higher level patterns that are, are clear to um, the experts. Okay, and one last difference that's worth noting is that experts respond to earlier perceptual cues than non-experts. So again, this is studies across the board show that experts are quicker at detecting various sports-specific movements, uh, and they're also more accurate at predicting the results of those movements. So the capacity to rely on uh, early cues has been widely established. Again, so I'm going to quote from a meta-analysis from 2007, um, and this is, uh, this is Mann et al. writing. They say, temporal and spatial occlusion techniques have been employed to systematically demonstrate expert, non-expert differences in the use of information presented early in the visual display across a wide variety of sports. Again, uh, just a list, tennis, badminton, squash, cricket, baseball, and volleyball. A summary of these experiment, uh, sorry, a study of these experiments suggests that one, Experts are better able to predict the direction and force of an opponent's strike based on kinematic information that maintains subtle cues, right, such as the dominant arm of a tennis player. And two, experts are more adept than non-experts at using early flight cues to predict the ball's end location. 
These findings have been relatively consistent, signifying the attunement of expert level performers to advanced cues otherwise neglected by non-expert performers. Okay, so that's a lot of information about sports psychology. Let's get back to virtue, right? How is it that we should apply any of this, right? Should we apply any of these findings to moral cognition, to moral expertise, to moral skill, right? So is it really the case that the detection and the identification of moral situations in the first place, right, moral inputs, is really important for uh, moral cognition, right? So is perceptual attention, recognition, and prediction really implicated here like it is in these sports cases where obviously there are significant differences, right? In the sports case, you have, you know, real fast time reactions that are required. You're already in a particular domain, right? Um, is, this, is, is there any way in which we can apply what we've learned about motor expertise or motor skill back to the moral domain? Um, and to my mind, I think that there is a fairly robust case to be made for, uh, for why we ought to or how it is that we ought to be able to uh, make this kind of connection. So um, Lawrence Blum, who's a philosopher at UMass in Boston, writes the following. <coughs> An agent may reason well in moral situations uphold the, strict, the strictest standards of impartiality for testing her maxims and moral principles and be adept at deliberation. Yet, unless she perceives moral situations as moral situations, and unless she perceives their moral character accurately, her moral principles and skill at deliberation will be for naught and may even lead her astray. In fact, one of the most important moral differences between people is between those who miss and those who see various moral features of situations confronting them. I mean, the takeaway point is that you know, even the best deliberator or even the best um, decision maker isn't really going to be a moral agent if she doesn't recognize the times at which she ought to deliberate or make decisions or respond to moral situations. That is, if one goes about one's life sort of barely noticing when one is confronted with moral situations in the first place, then no amount of diligence, right, whether it's uh, following principles, again, even internalized, subtle, nuanced principles, no ability to articulate why a given action is the right action in a particular situation is going to guarantee that the agent is actually going to employ these principles or abilities um, or explanations in the right situations. Right. So if we want to just think about how ubiquitous the need for proper attention is, um, we can think of, again, this is like a very mundane situation. So <clears throat> this is, again, a, a situation that Blum um, uh, forwards. He says, John and Joan are sitting on a subway train, or the tube, right? There are no empty seats, and some people are standing. Yet the subway car is not packed so tightly as to be uncomfortable for everyone. One of the passengers standing is a woman in her 30s holding two relatively full shopping bags. In this picture, she's holding uh, or carrying instead of a fairly pregnant belly. Um, John is not particularly paying attention to the woman, but he is cognizant of her. That's the kind of situation that we're thinking of. Joan, by contrast, is distinctly aware that the woman is uncomfortable. Thus, different aspects of the situation are salient for Joan and for John. Now, one can see that even if one has internalized a more or less general principle, or even a particular principle about when one ought to, when one can offer help to someone uh, who is in discomfort, but one also lacks the ability to detect when another person is in discomfort, then this kind of principle 
just isn't going, e again, even if it's automatic, even if it's nuanced, right? If you don't know when to use it, right? If you cannot detect the situations in which you ought to use it, then it's going to be useless. Now, again, what I'm emphasizing is just that detecting and attending to morally relevant features of a situation ought to be central to our thinking about moral cognition. That is detecting, identifying, attending to the moral inputs of a situation is, should be central when we're thinking about morality. Um, again, so one of the important things here is the situation, <coughs> at least the, the kind of situation that we're imagining, right, isn't that John is callous, right? It's not that John doesn't care. We can imagine John being sort of of average moral sensibilities, and we can even imagine that if someone had pointed out to John that this person was uncomfortable, then John would have offered his seat, right, or done the appropriate thing, right? What we're imagining here is that his failure to act uh, stems from his failure to notice, right, with appropriate salience, uh, what, this, what situation he is confronted with. And I take it that we all sort of know these kinds of people. Um, you know, someone who doesn't notice things uh, and then apologizes for not noticing, but they're still confident that had they noticed, they would have done the right thing. Right. And in some ways, I have to admit that I, I kind of find this person even more infuriating than the person that just wouldn't do the right thing and, uh, you know, out of callousness. Because in some ways, this person is still confident in her moral standing, right? They're, they don't change how they consider themselves because they still think that they're, they would have done the right thing, but they let themselves off the hook for not noticing when the situation calls for them to act in particular ways. <clears throat> okay, so a second parallel that we can see here, if, if, again, if we want to explore the analogy between uh, practical skill and moral expertise, is whether we should um, attribute to the moral expert the ability to recognize and recall perceptual features or patterns, moral, moral situational patterns, that remain undetectable or uh, more difficult to detect for the non-expert or the layperson. Now again, this might go for recognizing that one is in a moral situation in the first place, for instance, um, that one is encountering a situation of injustice or wrongdoing. Um, very broadly construed. It might go for detecting and identifying that one is in a moral situation of a particular type, right? So it might be that um, experts are better able to recognize that they are confronted with a particular kind of situation, let's say, of racism or sexism. Or a third interpretation, and uh, this is the interpretation that I prefer, and I'll say a bit more about this in the last section of the talk, is that perceptual skills in the moral domain contribute to the recognition and classification of morally relevant properties. For instance, that a person is in pain, that a person is in discomfort. Um, but it does seem that because recognizing and categorizing situations or certain features of situations at least on the face of it, appears relevant for uh, influencing follow-on deliberation and for influencing the appropriate response, uh, we should pay attention to this aspect of selection, right? Selecting the right inputs. Because, I mean, at least um, prime facie, it seems that uh, if we have a situation, uh, we have two situations, right? One situation where we have a person who feels sadness, say, um, or has been made to feel sad, another, and it require, again, let's imagine that both of these situations um, would require some sort of response 
from us. We have another situation where someone has been humiliated or made to feel humiliated. Um, again, a situation that uh, we're presupposing would, would require response. Presumably, the response would be different in each of those situations, right? The right thing to do would depend on identifying what the situation is in the first place in order to then select what the right thing to do is. Um, and so if it's the case that the moral expert is able to do this in a way that the, the moral layperson or the moral non-expert isn't, then this should really um, draw our attention to the fact that we should, we should be paying attention to this aspect, to this skill that um, moral cognition requires. Now, um, the third kind of um, analogy, again, uh, we're asking whether early cue detection is relevant in the moral domain. Um, and it might seem that here we have sort of the biggest disparity because many moral situations just don't seem to have the time pressures that um, are required in the sporting domain. But I think there is at least an important subset of moral situations that do require say, thinking on one's feet or reacting immediately. Right? And so an example of this kind of situation um, might be something that um, those of us in philosophy would be completely unfamiliar with. But let's say um, one's at a conference dinner. Right? Um, we see uh, we're sitting at a table and there is you know, a, a, a senior scholar who's making you know, off-color remarks, sexist remarks or racist remarks. Um, the, or another example that those of us in philosophy are completely unfamiliar with, we have uh, you know, a keynote speaker who um, is clearly uh, making someone uncomfortable after a talk. And you see that uh, one in, in this situation, right, the idea is you don't have all of the time in the world to do the right thing. Right? You, have to, you have to intervene. Right? If intervention is appropriate, you have to intervene swiftly. Right? You have to do the right thing in a certain situation, given the time constraints of that situation. Right? So you can't go home and call your, you know, your ethicist friend. You can't write in to the New York Times for advice on what you should do. Right? It requires that you notice what's happening and you notice it with enough time that you can then figure out what the right thing to do is uh, and with enough time to then implement the strategy, right? To implement what it is that your follow-on deliberation shows us. So I think it's not um, at all, um, it's not, at all implausible to see that at least a subset of moral situations require us to act in those situations on the spot rather than sort of in having the time to reflect. It, let's say if there's a situation of say, you know, historical wrongdoing, it doesn't seem that there's the same time pressure, but there certainly are moral situations. And you might even think that most moral situations are these kinds of situations, that they require um, a, a, a quick response, or at least a response that is time pressured, even if it's not the same sorts of time pressures as tennis, right? <clears throat> so in the last section of the talk, what I'd like to do is just to briefly present some preliminary um, suggestions for how I think this kind of moral perception might work, right? The kind of moral perception, this um, sensitivity to inputs that might work um, for moral expertise. So the position that I'm going to endorse piggybacks on an account of moral cognition that's been forwarded by um, Jesse Prinz. And for those of you familiar with his account, I should, um, I should be clear as a caveat that I'm not sort of endorsing sentimentalism or emotivism in general here. I'm, I'm piggybacking uh, rather on his view of emotions. 
right? Um, and how it is that he uh, ties emotions to morality, right? So what I'd really like to emphasize and what I'm going to uh, use from Jesse's account is what I take to be the supremely plausible assumption or view rather that uh, moral uh, judgments typically involve an emotional component. Right? That's sort of the only part of the view that I'm going to, to take. So according to Prinz, right, emotional attitudes are non-cognitive perceptions of bodily changes that are caused by certain events, actions, or traits in the world, right? So the way that um, this view works is to follow um, Dretzky insofar as saying that when these kinds of emotions um, are caused by certain features of the world, right, if they track these features, then they represent these features, right? That's um, I think a really important uh, aspect of the view that you can have non-cognitive perceptions of the body that, that have representational content. Right? So emotions are non-cognitive um, perceptions that represent those uh, features, traits, or events that cause them. That's, that's the view. So um, as an example, we can think of sadness as an emotional attitude that detects loss, um, and fear as an emotional attitude that tracks danger. Uh, and the idea is that these uh, emotions represent loss and danger insofar as they're caused by loss and danger systematically. So um, on Prince's account, these, uh, these representations are collected into what he calls calibration files, right? And this means that when similar emotional states are caused by similar events or features in the world, they're, um, they're collected into something like a corresponding mental folder, right? And so the way, what it is that a certain emotion represents can change over time. It can be refined over time uh, when it's caused in the right ways by the right kinds of events or properties in the world. So I think this way of thinking about emotions neatly allows us to think about the refinement and development of emotional perception. Right? Uh, and this is because, again, we have these capacities, we have these capacities uh, by nature, right? They're given to us evolutionarily, but that doesn't mean that they're fixed or brute or anything like that. We can refine these capacities uh, as we go through our lives, right? And they can be calibrated in order to track the relevant features. Now, the way that I'm going to use this view, right, is to say that as one practices, right, performing the right action at the right time, directed at the right person, in the right circumstances, what one develops, at the very least, is a refined capacity to track morally relevant features of the world via emotional perception. Right? So through practice, one develops emotional attitudes that are calibrated to the relevant features of um, a moral situation. And I think that refined emotional perception of this kind just gives us a natural way to think about the improvements in attention, identification, and prediction that come with moral expertise. Now, we should also ask what kinds of features are we thinking about when we're thinking about this kind of emotional <coughs> perception? Um, so we're going to say moral expertise involves a kind of emotional perception, right? Uh, it, that doesn't mean that that's all that's required for moral expertise, but the, that uh, morality has a component, an emotional component to it, right? That also accounts for uh, very nicely sort of the motivational aspect of morality. 
Um, but we should ask, what kinds of features or properties is this kind of emotional perception that's relevant for morality tracking? Um, and so I indicated on, on Prinz's account, emotional attitudes represent phenomena such as loss or danger. Um, and in the case of moral expertise, I think it's likely that perception represents other morally relevant properties like pain, suffering, or, and discomfort, right? And this seems likely because these are the kinds of properties that not only are they central to morality, but they're also basic to the emotional system of humans. So Sean Nichols uh, writes about, um, again, the connection between emotions and morality. And he writes that <clears throat> witnessing or learning of suffering in others often excites considerable affective response in humans. This emotional responsiveness to others' suffering emerges very early in ontogeny. Indeed, emotional responses to suffering in others seems to be present in infancy. Such responses are almost certainly cross-culturally universal. They might even be present in some non-human primates. We come pre-tuned to be upset by the distress signals of others. And our emotional responsiveness to suffering in others is fairly impressive by the second birthday. Now, the detection and identification of pain, suffering, discomfort, and others is, again, very likely evolutionarily grounded. But we should, uh, we should notice that this doesn't mean that um, it's unresponsive to training or that it can't be refined in any way. And indeed, it does seem that a good deal of our moral education focuses on developing an individual sense of compassion or empathy. And I recently was reading um, a study, and I think this, this is a nice illustration of why it is that the emotional component uh, of moral cognition is, is so not only important, but effective. Right? What you had was two groups of uh, children. I think they were um, three to five-year-olds. Um, and one was given a rule. Right? So they were given a rule for why they ought not to do something. And another group was given an explanation that pointed to an emotional uh, response in another person, right? So let's say, um, I think it was sadness. That if they did something, it would make someone sad. Um, and what you saw, and this is, I think, very interesting, is that in the group that was given the rule, right, don't do X, <laughs> um, or don't do A, right? Uh, you didn't see any changes in behavior. You didn't see any changes in uh, cooperation. You didn't see any changes in pro-social behavior. And um, in fact, sort of the rule following didn't change. <laughs> Whereas for the group of children that was given the explanation that pointed to the reason why uh, the, the rule should be followed that, that pointed to an emotional reason. Right? You saw a significant difference in um, cooperation, pro-social behavior, and rule following. Again, just showing that um, in, in our basic reasoning about uh, various actions and the kinds of things that we take to be relevant to morality, emotions seem to play um, a fairly central, um, a central role. Um, and again, so it would make sense that through our moral education, right, as we develop a kind of perceptual capacity, as we develop a kind of moral expertise that involves a perceptual capacity, a perceptual skill that um, detects and identifies uh, perceptual inputs, right, it would be the emotional kinds of inputs that would be refined and calibrated through uh, practice, through doing the right thing regularly. Okay, so um, just to, to close, obviously there's a lot more to say, especially on the last section. I think this is really sort of how it is that we should fill in this kind of account of moral expertise and the kind of perception, the kind of emotional perception that really um, is figuring 
in, if there is such a thing, right? If there is such a thing as moral expertise, what kind of perception might be there? I think there's a lot more to say sort of as a, as a philosopher, um, as a philosopher of mind and cognitive science to fill in the details. But I think the take home message should be clear at least that if, again, this is a hypothetical, right? Uh, it's a conditional statement. If we want to take seriously the analogy between moral cognition and practical skill, then we should think seriously about the way in which moral inputs are selected by moral experts. We should think seriously about this because it seems that a whole host of robust empirical evidence in the domain of motor skill points to the fact that domain-specific input selection is absolutely central to expertise. And again, if morality is a kind of skill, or if it involves a kind of skill, um, and I think that it's not implausible that it might, then thinking about moral perception in this way can shed light on the acquisition and refinement of moral cognition. Thank you. <laughs>